Welcome back to the next lecture. In this one, we are going to look at pediatric GI diseases. I've broken this lecture into two parts, so GI disease part one and then part two. Uh, in the next lecture, we will go over the remainder, but in this one, we're going to focus on some things like pyloric stenosis and tussiception um, and sort of dive into those topics. So let's start first with pyloric stenosis. Now, this is all a review from step one, I'm hoping. This is a condition whereby the gastric outlet becomes obstructed because that pyloric sphincter is hypertrophied. Now, some important risk factors you want to keep in mind as it relates to this condition includes male gender, especially if they are the firstborn child, uh, smoking while pregnant, having a family history of pyloric stenosis, uh, as well as the use of macrolides in the infants or mothers, especially if the infant is two weeks of age or younger. And symptoms will most commonly occur between three and six weeks of life. Very rarely would it occur after 12. Now, the typical patient here will, will present with projectile vomiting immediately after a feeding. And one important key to remember about this is that shortly after vomiting, they will indicate that they're still hungry. That's an important clue for, for you on the exam because if they're actually sick, they probably would not show you that. Now, depending on how early the patient's brought to you for medical attention, they may be significantly dehydrated. So this could be exemplified by dry mucous membranes or a decreased number of wet diapers. That needs to be addressed. Another important finding is that palpable olive-like mass that you typically feel in the right upper quadrant of the abdomen. Now, with this condition, patients typically present early enough that electrolyte abnormalities aren't always present, but some patients still present with that classic lab finding of hypochloremic, hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis. That, of course, is the result of vomiting. We need to address that. In terms of imaging for pyloric stenosis, your first-line imaging modality is going to be the abdominal ultrasound where the target sign of the pylorus can be visualized on transverse view, and the presence of an abnormally large pyloric muscle diameter, thickness, and length can be confirmed. So the diagnosis can be either made clinically when the clinician palpates that olive-like mass in the abdomen, or can be made when we find these characteristic ultrasound findings, such as the target sign, as well as the increased size. Now, treatment involves first correcting the, ab the uh, electrolyte abnormalities and the fluid defects, which is then followed by pyloromyotomy, and that helps to remove excessive pyloric tissue and then relieve obstruction at the, ga the gastric outlet. Next up is another highly tested condition known as intussusception. This should be a review from step one as well. This occurs when part of the intestine moves into an adjacent segment of intestine. We often refer to this as telescoping, and this simply describes the way by which part of the intestine slides into itself, such as how a telescope would collapse down. Now, usually in children, intussusception occurs when they are between 6 and 36 months of age, and while the majority of cases of intussusception are idiopathic, a physical lead point can lead to intussusception, and these lead points are an abnormality where a peristalsis may push this physical deformity into the distal segment of the intestine. Now, these deformities can include things like tumors, Meckel's diverticulum, polyps, among other deformities, and they are all a lead point because they lead the way by dragging the intestine in on itself. GI infections can lead to hypertrophy of lymphoid tissue, such as the pyre patches. This, uh, again, can be a possible lead point. Patients will typically present with severe cramping, uh, abdominal pain, and this starts intermittently and then progressively gets worse and worse, becoming more and more frequent. Now, one of the classic findings that you're going to see is that palpable sausage-shaped mass, often found on the right side of the abdomen, usually in the middle aspect or the right upper quadrant. A rare occurrence here would be a scaphoid shape in the right lower quadrant. This is known as dance's sign. This is due to abdominal retraction in the area. Now, patients will usually have bloody stool, oftentimes referred to as current jelly, and if not grossly bloody, an, uh, an occult blood test may still be positive. So even though you don't see the blood, um, they may give you this information in the vignette, and that can really help you uh, narrow down your diagnosis. Now, patients who have intussusception also commonly present with intermittent lethargy, which is pretty nonspecific, but something to keep an eye out for. In terms of imaging for this condition, two forms of imaging are usually performed. First line is the ultrasound. We can identify that target sign here, representing the layers of the intestine which have telescoped in on themselves. The second would be the abdominal x-ray. This is primarily performed just to assess for perforation. So first line, ultrasound. Now, pneumoperitoneum can be seen with perforation. This is caused by the presence of air under the diaphragm. There are also some nonspecific findings that you might see on x-ray, like distended loose of bowel, a crescent-shaped soft tissue mass. This is the intussusception itself. Now, when it comes to treatment, if patients 
don't have signs of perforation, they're not acutely ill, they can undergo non-operative reduction as the main form of treatment. And we perform this with either hydrostatic or pneumatic pressure that we introduce via an enema. And this is typically guided by an ultrasound to help visualize and confirm that the reduction has in fact occurred. Now, if there are signs of perforation, or if they're acutely ill, or if they failed non-operative reduction, management would be with surgical laparop lap laparoscopic reduction. Now, if perforation is also present, we of course have to repair that bowel as well. Next up, we've got intestinal malrotation with volvulus. So intestinal malrotation occurs early in fetal development when the bowel fails to rotate and take its normal position in the abdomen. Intestinal malrotation doesn't always cause disease, but it does predispose patients to volvulus, which is when loops of intestine twist around themselves, causing that bowel obstruction. So patients who have intestinal malrotation with volvulus can present with the signs of bowel obstruction, including bilious vomiting, abdominal pain, and abdominal distension. Now, as bowel becomes necrotic from a lack of blood supply, patients can develop bloody stools. They can develop a rigid abdomen as a result of peritonitis if part of the bowel wall ruptures, as well as hemodynamic instability from hypovolemia or septic shock. Now, intestinal malrotation is more likely to occur, to occur in patients with other congenital anomalies. So um, one that you really want to keep an eye out for is the diaphragmatic hernia. Other abnormalities that can be associated with this, though, are mechal diverticulum, certain heart defects, as well as atresias, especially those in the intestines, the biliary tract, or the esophagus. So look out for all of those in the vignette description when they potentially are trying to push us towards this diagnosis. Now, on abdominal x-ray, free intraperitoneal gas will be, will be visible if a perforation is present. And if that's the case, then immediately we get the patient into surgery without any further imaging. Now, if no free gas is seen, then either an upper GI contrast study can be performed, which may show a misplaced duodenum with corkscrew appearance, or an ultrasound, which may identify the whirlpool sign, which occurs when whirls of mesenteric vessels are seen as the bowel rotates around its mesentery. Intestinal myorotation with volvulus is going to be confirmed with emergent exploratory surgery. Confirmed. Now, this happens after our first step, which was, of course, to ensure that the patient is resuscitated with fluids and started on empiric antibiotics with coverage of bowel flora in case there was a perforation. Once this has been done, emergency exploratory surgery with repairs performed. And what we're going to do here is the LAD procedure. This involves placing adhesive bands over the mesentery to widen the base of the mesentery and reduce the likelihood of a future volv volvulus from developing. The malrotation itself can't actually be corrected. Next up, we've got mechal diverticulum. Now, this is a true intestinal diverticulum. Remember, that means that it contains all layers of the small bowel wall. This results from failure of the vitaline duct to obliterate during embryonic development. And we have the rule of twos, which is often used to describe this. Remember, this means 2% of the population has it. The lesion's at least two inches long. It's located two feet from the ileocecal valve. It affects men two times more often than women. And 2% of those with a mechal diverticulum will develop complications, usually by the age of two years. So the vast majority of patients are actually going to be asymptomatic. But when ectopic gastric mucosa is present in the diverticulum, ulceration of the small bowel, which is downstream of the mechal diverticulum, can occur as a result of acid secreting from that tissue. Now, aside from the painless bleeding that we see when the ectopic gastric mucosa causes ulceration of the small bowel, some complications may arise from this diverticulum, including intussusception, volvulus, diverticulitis, as well as torsion of the diverticulum. Now, these complications will present differently than a painless GI bleed and can have similar presentations to what you would expect if the mechal diverticulum was not involved. So for example, with intussusception, you can have severe abdominal cramping, you can have grossly bloody stool, you can see vomiting. Many of the complications associated with this can lead to pain, uh, including intussusception, volvulus, diverticulitis, obstruction, perforation, and or torsion. Now, the treatment for mechal diverticulum is going to depend really on how the diverticulum is discovered and if there are symptoms or not. For cases of asymptomatic mechal diverticulum that are identified in imaging, no treatment is needed. If an asymptomatic mechal diverticulum is identified in children during surgical abdominal exploration, then what we would recommend is surgical uh, resection of the diverticulum. Now, for symptomatic cases, we're going to manage these according to the, the pathology that is presenting. So, for example, if they're bleeding, they should receive proton pump inhibitors, fluids, and transfusions as needed. If there's an obstruction, we put in an NG tube, we decompress the stomach while providing fluids. 
All symptomatic cases of Meckel's should be treated with resection as well, but ultimately, whatever the problem is, we're going to address it as an individual problem. All right, let's do some content review questions. First question, 20 seconds on the clock. If you need more time, hit that pause button and then come on back. Correct answer here is B. Next question, 20 seconds on the clock. Once you've got the answer, come on back. The correct answer here is C. Final question, 20 seconds on the clock. Once you got the answer, come on back. Correct answer here is A. That is the end of this lecture. I will see you guys in part two of pediatric GI diseases.